Good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning, uh, depending on where you're joining us uh, from. I'm Tracy Brown, the Director of Sense About Science, uh, and wherever you are in the world, a very warm welcome to the John Maddox Prize 2020. We're joined here in the Green Room by today's special guests and well-wishers from governments and science bodies around the world on Zoom by 300 invited guests and on the live stream to the Overspill Room via YouTube. Welcome to all of you. Now in its ninth year, the John Maddox Prize for Standing Up for Science recognises one or two individuals each year for communicating sound science in the face of difficulty or hostility. When we launched the prize together with Nature almost a decade ago, we sought to champion uh, uh, the effort that's often needed to get sound science into public discussion. An effort that we at Sense About Science and Nature had been well schooled in by the late John Maddox, our trustee and editor of Nature for 26 years. Well, we didn't know when we launched it uh, back then just how many stories of that effort the prize nominations, the hundreds now of prize nominations we received from around the world uh, would tell. There are so many circumstances in which researchers and scientists uh, have to, uh, which researchers and scientists have to encounter in order to get sound science and evidence into public debate. And these have included things like spurious lawsuits to silence them, institutions isolating them for fear of public backlash, hounding and harassment, and sometimes just a really, really uphill battle uh, in the wake of, in the face of, of, of public controversy. Those previous prizes have included people like Elizabeth Loftus, who set up experiments to investigate recovered memory. Last year's prize went to Bambang Hiro Sahajo, who used forensics to investigate peatland fires set by palm oil companies. A prize awarded some uh, years ago uh, and very relevant right now is to was to Riko Muranaka, um, a, a Japanese science writer uh, who investigated the cause of the HPV vaccine in Japan um, uh, for the public health um, campaign falling to pieces. And we've added an early career prize because though many of those circumstances that were raised showed extraordinary um, bravery and persistence on the part of people uh, who were at the same time trying to forge their careers. So we added an early career prize a few years ago and I'm delighted to say that we're going to be awarding that this evening uh, first. And we've been joined by new judges to help us meet that challenge. Uh, and we, we are uh, now joined by judges across the world uh, who help us to understand as judges, as a panel of judges, uh, some of those really trying and difficult circumstances uh, that researchers face when they try to meet the public uh, through difficult discussion. So as we came into this ninth year, we really thought as judges that we'd seen the fullest range of what people encounter when they tackle difficult or controversial issues against rumour, misinformation, entrenched views, interests and prejudice and we really hadn't uh, we really have seen this year extraordinary effort uh, on the part of the scientific community researchers and science communicators all across the globe and i think as judges we were really moved uh, by looking at that effort uh, in our judging um, this autumn in just a moment, I have the pleasure of introducing Bronwyn Maddox to say a few words about her father, and then my fellow judge, Magdalena Skipper, editor-in-chief of Nature, to introduce and present first the Early Career Research Prize, uh, and then the John Maddox Prize 2020. But first, I do want to pay tribute to my fellow judges, uh, who have, with great uh, humour and empathy, um, uh, worked through some uh, really uh, uh, amazingly impressive stories uh, over recent years uh, and helped us to, uh, to champion the values that we set out uh, uh, as nature and ourselves uh, in establishing this prize. And second, I want to pay tribute before we start to the many people around the world who have walked towards the public, not away from them, to guide them through the emerging evidence of the pandemic. I only wish that every government did that too. Bronwyn Maddox. If you unmute yourself, Bronwyn. 
Sorry, you would think this far into the coronavirus year, one would have learned these uh, these things. Tracy, thanks very much indeed, and Magdalena and uh, all the judges, very very well done on this. Um, I would say every year is probably difficult to make these decisions, but this one um, has been a really extraordinary year. And I, um, I wish many times during this year that I'd known what my father would have made of it, uh, because he would have been uh, enthralled, appalled by lots of it, but enthralled by the clash, if you like. Um, well, first, the spectacle of science um, done at a grand global uh, scale, uh, done very fast, but drawing on years, decades often, of very difficult work, really drawing on some of the very latest science. Um, and then the clash with politics, which was his second love, um, uh, but, but the science, I, I think, dominating all the way through. Um, but the clash um, with people's views, with, with, with what po uh, politicians felt they could pull off, and the, the misunderstandings that come out of that. And this is where this, this prize in any sense about science um, so much come to the, the fore. Because on the one hand, you have the huge expectations of what, what science can deliver. And in fact, it seems uh, to, to have, have done that uh, this year. On the other hand, you don't want people to take that for granted. This is difficult work. It is difficult intellectual work built on years of, of research. And you don't want people to assume that it is um, all easy, that it even, uh, is simply given to a kind of magical thinking. Um, he would have been fascinated by the debate still going on, still very live about, about vaccines, about whether to, um, to, to, to have them or not, and just how that remains all these years on. Um, I was one of the, uh, I wouldn't say the last people to get measles, but I was one of that generation who, 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 who did. Um, and I remember uh, very small uh, having uh, lectures on, on the desirability of vaccines. Um, uh, the creation of vaccines. I don't think he held me to responsible age three for not having it, but um, it be, be, being delivered. And um, we, 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 we have this battle still to play out, I think, in politics and science. Um, and we don't know what people are going to make of all this. So it has been an extraordinary year. It's been a very good year for science in many, many ways. Uh, it hasn't been, I think, such a good year for politics and, and government, which have been strained, sometimes almost a breaking point. But um, it really does bring all these things very much to the fore. And I think the kind of um, uh, debate we've seen going into these, these prizes um, really brings to the fore of um, you know, what is at stake and what people have to defend when they are indeed standing up for science. So thank you very much indeed. And um, I wish my father had been here to see it, but um, then there wouldn't be a John Maddox prize, I guess. Thank you, Bronwyn. And we would if we were gathered together at the Wellcome Collection uh, or any other august institution to, to give these prizes tonight, take this moment to raise a glass to your father and the inspiration he was to our organisations. It, it would have been red wine, I think. That's what I agree. And and family it. tradition lives on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. Wonderful words. Magdalena Skipper, can I ask you to do the honours this evening? Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. It's my real pleasure to, to be here. And let me begin by giving you some insights into what it was like for us, uh, the judges. And of course, just like everything else this year, the, the 2020 Maddox Prize judging meeting was unusual. It was unusual because unlike in the other years when we get together in one room in the nature offices in King's Cross in London, this year, of course, our meeting was virtual. Um, and of course, by this stage in the year, we were indeed proficient in, uh, in virtual meetings. But apart from the format itself, the process was familiar. And, and as in previous years, we were presented with a short list of outstanding candidates, each of whom uh, has stood up for science and truth in their own way and in their own discipline. And the task of the judges is never easy. Um, it certainly wasn't this time either, even though because of the circumstances in many ways, uh, the winners were um, uh, clear to emerge. Um, the panel, which I have uh, the privilege to be part of, of course, includes uh, Lord Rees of uh, Ladlow, Professor Colin uh, Blakemore, Professor Dennis Lowe, Professor Terence Forrester, Dr. Natasha Loder, and Anin uh, Luo as well. And as a reminder, the judges evaluate shortlisted nominations, um, taking into the account 
how clearly the individual in question advanced the discussion of good science despite challenges, the nature of the challenge faced by the uh, nominated uh, individual, how well they placed the evidence in the wider debate and engaged others, and also the level of influence on the public debate. This year, we received some 200, over 200 nominations from 38 different countries, more than ever before. It is truly gratifying to see that the nominations come from right across the globe. But at the same time, it is troubling, of course, to see that in so many parts of the world, standing up for science comes with personal challenges and adversities. I must say that it is a personal highlight to read the achievements of everyone on the shortlist. Each is an accomplished researcher who also feels strongly compelled to stand up for science. I am also very proud that Nature is partnering with Sense About Science on this award, not just because there's an obvious link with our history, of course, with John Maddox being one of my predecessors at the helm of Nature, and because standing up, standing up for truth and science is part of our mission at Nature, but also because what the award stands for is so important. And this year, perhaps like no other year in recent history, has supplied us with um, ample evidence for it. And so in addition to the winners, whom I will be announcing uh, just in a minute, I would like to mention that the judges also wish to recognize the extraordinary efforts by um, A.I. Fen and uh, Li Wenliang, two doctors at Wuhan General Hospital. The judges felt that they went above and beyond to communicate the concerns about the presence of novel coronavirus, particularly when considering the positions they were in and consequences they were likely to face. And illustrating the difficult choice our panel faced, um, the judges would also like to commend uh, the work of two other nominees, the work of Donato uh, Boschia, head of the Bari unit of CNR Institute for St Sustainable Plant Protection, for his continuing work to identify and fight the uh, Zylella fastiosa, um, fastifiosa outbreak decimating the olive industry in Italy. And in addition, the judges um, would like to commend the work of Lucas Garibaldi, director of IRNAD, for his efforts and encouragement or engagement with agribusiness in Argentina to promote and engage with alternative farming practices. So without further ado, I'd like to move to the introduction of the Early Career Award. So three years ago, we introduced the Early Career Researcher category to the John Maddox Prize. The judges felt that it was important to acknowledge the efforts and the reach of researchers at early stages in their career and to recognize the impact that they can have on standing up for science, despite, in some cases, potentially negative prospects for their professional advancement. And so it really does give me an enormous pleasure to announce that this year's winner of the John Maddox Prize in Early Career Research category is Dr. Anne Abbott, who's Associate Professor at the Central Clinical School at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Abbott is awarded the prize for her efforts and perseverance in pushing against received wisdom in medicine, highlighting the potential to move away from unnecessary clinical interventions and procedures in the treatment of carotid stenosis. The, sur the surgical and stenting procedures that were in, in many places still are, unfortunately, the standard of care for those with arterial disease that narrows the carotid artery are a multi-billion multinational industry. Um, Dr. Abbott discovered that medical intervention alone is best for preventing stroke in people with advanced arterial disease and that there is currently no proven benefit for any carotid procedure compared to medical intervention. Dr. Abbott's work focused um, or, or caused a shift towards uh, the most effective stroke prevention methods, improving practice, 
and policy worldwide. And it's important to note that she has continued to work and, and advocate despite an, a lack of support and in some cases outright opposition from her academic seniors, discon, uh, discontinued employment from a number of institutions and exclusion from local professional networks and even death threats. Nevertheless, she has continued her outreach to the public, uh, politicians and other decision makers. Dr. Abbott, many, many congratulations and the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you very much um, for that introduction and you've said it all really. I don't think I need to say any more. <laughs> um, but I, I have prepared, I was asked to prepare a four minute presentation. Would you like me to proceed with that at the moment or? Please yes? do, absolutely. Oh, all right. So I have a summary of my story so far. Um, some of this has already been mentioned, but um, mine was actually a, a good news discovery and it was related to the carotid artery, which is the main brain artery and the carotid artery is a common site of narrowing due to arterial disease, which can cause stroke. My discovery was that stroke prevention has become much more effective, less invasive and cheaper over the last three to four decades. Specifically, the stroke prevention efficacy of lifestyle changes and medication has improved by at least 65% since the 1980s. And this means that carotid artery procedures such as surgery and stenting are, are no longer indicated for symptom-free people. In addition, fewer symptomatic people with stroke or transient ischemic attack are now likely to benefit from a carotid procedure. In fact, better outcomes are expected for all at risk of arterial disease, and that includes just about all of us. I thought that publishing my discovery in 2009 would be enough to change guidelines and practice, which for decades have encouraged widespread overuse of carotid procedures, but I was incorrect. In fact, I was told by seniors I should not publish my research results. On several occasions at different institutions, my academic employment was discontinued, but not because of scientific error. There was also resistance from the highest impact factor journals. These journals have readily published flawed interpretations of randomized trials and procedurally biased guidelines. However, the editors consistently declined to publish work showing the bias and how times have changed. And as mentioned, I've even had death threats. Evidently, my news was inconvenient. Turned out it challenged the status quo and a big business has built up directly and indirectly around the carotid procedures. I was shocked by the hostility and apparent disregard for patient welfare. However, the justice has, has, has served as a stimulus for me to continue. I employed several methods targeting the public, clinicians and policy advisors. These methods have included publishing alone, publishing with up to 50 other multinational opinion leaders, reaching out to retired surgeons internationally who were opinion leaders, and they gave me a voice at international conferences. Conference debates against senior, senior opinion leaders, lobbying guideline writers, lobbying the US president, testifying at the 2012 US Medicare Policy Review meeting regarding carotid artery disease management, starting an educational and action group called the Faculty Advocating Collaborative and Thoughtful Carotid Artery Treatments, FactCats. We share and debate scientific fact using group email. Also creating and maintaining an educational website for the public and professionals, factcats.org. Lay press publications, including in the Reader's Digest and the Wall Street Journal. It has taken years true grit and often working for no income. However, great progress is being made and this has justified all the effort. For example, my campaign prevented US Medicare from expanding carotid stenting reimbursement indications. Rates of carotid procedures are falling around the world and new design randomized trials have started. 
These trials include a medical intervention only arm when previously only carotid procedures were compared. Guidelines have been slower to improve, but I'm not waiting. I have started to create the world's first evidence true guideline for carotid artery disease under the auspices of the International Union of Angiology. Plus we have started up a new trial called CASCOM to measure the impact of current optimal medical intervention alone for stroke prevention. There is no denying it, incompetence and corruption are to the detriment of us all. Critical to improving outcomes is the expectation of bias, conflict of interest and the bullying that is often associated. Next is having a plan in place, no matter who is involved. And we all have a part to play in this. And rather than saying or doing nothing, it is very important to speak up and act to correct injustice, even if the injustice appears small. Strategies which work include listening to others, independent review of the scientific facts, and teaming up to put things right. I'd like to finish there. Thank you very much, Professor Abbott, for this very powerful statement. Tracy, would you like to come in at this point? Ms. Lena, please go straight to the main event. I will do that. Thank you. So, of course, 2020 um, has in so many ways um, been the year for science, but arguably even more so for public health. Coronavirus and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic have been on everyone's lips, on every newspaper's front page, all over social media and various other online media outlets. It has also been a year in which we've seen how science can and does influence policy. Of course, the strong scientific foundation should be the basis of policy making at any time, but this year this interaction has played out almost on a daily basis uh, before our eyes. I am truly delighted to announce on behalf of the judges, uh, Sense About Science and Nature, that the 2020 John Maddox Prize for Standing Up for Science is awarded jointly to Dr. Anthony Fauci and Professor Slim Abdul Karim uh, for the communication of accurate medical advice to the public in the US and uh, South Africa, respectively. The, the judges had no hesitation in recognizing the efforts far beyond the line of duty as government advisors on health policy during the COVID-19 pandemic, as they both did uh, back in the 1980s uh, during the AIDS crisis. Over 30 years ago, Dr. Fauci oversaw most of the US, US government's uh, medical response to the AIDS crisis, while Professor Karim was one of the key scientists who spoke out against AIDS denialism globally. Now, they both lead their respective countries' scientific response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The joint winners were praised for the, by the nominators for their leadership and clear communication of science during the current crisis. Dr. Fauci's honest and inclusive manner in speaking to everyone, be they patients, journalists, or world leaders, has been praised widely. He is known for being dedicated to working with journalists, recognizing how important it is to make oneself available and at short notice. Over the course of this year, Dr. Fauci did not just explain the facts of the COVID-19 crisis, he also took the opportunity to explain how science is done, the fact that its position is revised as new facts arise, um, and therefore how that um, aspect of science influences government's response. He became one of the most trusted voices on the crisis. The profoundly sad side effect of this public dedication has been the fact that he and his family became the target of harassment and death threats. In South Africa, Professor Karim um, has been focused on providing evidence-based guidance to the government, while at the same time emphasizing the importance of a well-informed public um, in pandemic crisis management. 
For this reason, engaging with the media and the public are, in his view, an integral part of being a scientist. He has developed a reputation for clear and honest communication, which he uses to shape public trust in science. Indeed, for example, earlier this year, when the uh, cases of COVID-19 were rising sharply in South Africa, his public broadcasts resulted in a tangible shift in public opinion around coronavirus measures in the country. And earlier this summer, uh, he proposed in a Q&A in our pages in Nature that South Africa's Ubuntu tradition of communities looking out for each other is key to the country's response. Many, many congratulations to our joint winners. And I would uh, now first like to hand over to Dr. Fauci for his um, acceptance speech. Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Magdalena, for that wonderful and very kind introduction. I'm really very uh, humbled by being in this position of receiving the John Maddox Prize, particularly meaningful for me to receive it together with my long-term colleague, uh, Slim Karim. Uh, we have been working together in different parts of the world on the same problem, as you mentioned and outlined correctly, from the early days of HIV to the current uh, historic challenge that we're facing uh, with COVID-19. Uh, I was just reviewing in my mind some of the things that I've had to be essentially facing ever since the very early years when I was a director. Uh, I was appointed actually uh, 36 years ago last month as director of the NIAID. And I've had the opportunity uh, to being put into the position of leading the response scientifically against HIV and virtually every outbreak that we've had to uh, address, including pandemic flu, Ebola, Zika, a variety of other diseases, and now COVID-19. Um, and when I think about some of the things that have gotten me through this uh, series of challenges, many of which actually were really stressed by issues of misinformation, particularly the issues of stigma that were associated with the early years of HIV, that we had to have science overcome the stigma. I learned a few things, and I would like to maybe spend a minute to just mention it to this group, was the first is the importance of listening. Uh, instead of walking away or confronting, and this was true with the activists that we had to deal with in the early years because they quite frankly were absolutely correct in challenging us in the way we did not give them a proper voice in the approach towards HIV, particularly in the United States and a willingness to change our minds uh, when new convincing arguments arose. The other is to tell the truth at all times and to do everything that is science-based and evidence-based and sometimes the truth means saying, I do not know. And that is important because often we are in a position, particularly with the evolving outbreak of COVID-19, that as the data evolved, we had to change some of our positions. The other is to be transparent, to never withhold information, always be welcoming open dialogue. And the other in communication that you mentioned, Magdalena, I have always tried to guide myself by what I call precision of thought and economy of expression. If you can't explain something simply, then you probably don't even understand it yourself. So those are the things that have guided me. The other thing that I just want to you know, close by is that we have been in such extraordinary circumstances. I know in the United States, we have been met with what you alluded to in your introduction is the need to stand up for science even when what is going on around you is very anti-scientific. And unfortunately, I've had to face that with regard to the promotion of drugs that don't work, to the disregarding of public health measures that you know work in the face of overwhelming evidence that when one disregards those public health measures, like wearing masks, avoiding crowds, keeping distances, that you have a very difficult and catastrophic situation. So my final 
message in this acceptance speech is that science is the way to getting to the end game of, a, of essentially stopping, ending, and eliminating the public health threats that we all face. In the United States today, it's really historic because we now have 2.9 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine that have just been started to being distributed to people throughout the country. It's the first step in a multi, multi month process of finally getting this extraordinary historic pandemic under control. And I hope that we all globally, since this is a global conversation, realize that we have a moral obligation to make sure that people throughout the world have access to this vaccine, not only those countries that are wealthy and can afford it and have the systems. So if there's one final message is we all should pull together to realize that as a global community, we are all in this together and we all are gonna get through it together. So thank you again very much, Magdalena. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. Some very powerful statements. Um, uh, science is the way to solving global problems and, and many other important thoughts. Thank you very much. Professor Karim, over to you. Thank you very much, Magdalena. It's indeed a great honor and a privilege for me to be here with you this afternoon. I'd like to thank Sense About Science and Nature for this honor. I'm particularly pleased to be here with my good friend and colleague, Anthony Fauci. He and I go back a long way, and he's been an icon to me, somebody who I've looked up to over many years. And I think for me, this is the uh, culmination of many years of trying to convey the essence of science to the public that this uh, award recognizes. When I uh, think back some 20 years ago, it was in around 1999, that our Minister of Health and our President in our country decided to take a position that denied the existence of HIV and AIDS. Those were difficult years. It was difficult not because, just because of the denialism. It was, it was difficult because of the consequences of that denialism and the consequences in terms of death and suffering that it led to. So as at that time, the head of AIDS research at the Medical Research Council, together with the president of the Medical Research Council at the time, Dr. Mahoba, we took on this challenge. And things came to a head in the AIDS conference in 2000 when we launched the Durban Declaration. But Professor Jerry Kuvadia and I were called into a meeting with the Minister of Health where she chided us and accused us of being disloyal and unpatriotic. Those were difficult days, but they were days that we could always hold our head up high because we stood for what was the truth and we stood for what science stood for. In all of that, we can look back and know that we did as much as we could. And when we combined our efforts together with the activists in the community, the community-based organizations, the, the various stakeholders, we were able to change policy and lead to treatment. Fast forward 20 years, and now in dealing with COVID-19, the challenges are much more complex. The issues that we face, still denialism. We have a whole groups of people that it's just flu. It's a different kind of denialism. We have the same, the same kinds of stigma, the same kinds of challenges. But ultimately, what we have to do is to stay true to the science. And for me, that has been a guiding light. As long as you stay with the truth and you don't bend for expediency, you don't bend because that will make somebody happy. You have to accept people will not be happy with what you say. Some will not like what you say, but that's what is the truth and that's what we have stood for. I'd like to end off by saying that in all of this time, I don't think I could have achieved any of this without the many people from my organization, Caprisa, who have stood with me, 
support all my many partners across the world, from the NIH to the uh, UK and throughout Africa, and then to my family, my children, my siblings, my wife, Kiresha. We have always stood together, and we know that together we'll always win if we're on the side of truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Karim. Um, staying true to the science was a, a real message that, that stood out so strongly for me. And with this, I'll hand over back to Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our winners for um, inspiring us once again um, with your words. Uh, we were inspired enough by your stories. Um, and. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing with us um, your, your thoughts. I think that's been, um, for me as a judge, a really powerful testament to what the prize stands for and why it matters. And it is unusual, in fact, to be awarding the prize to people who are in public office, because usually that role comes with some recognition of the, uh, of the work that you do. Uh, but we felt that what you have delivered sets a standard that is above and beyond what one could reasonably expect of anyone in public office um, by really owning that responsibility for public debate. And I think Sense About Science's point of view, we work with many communities around the world who are seeking evidence and understanding. And I cannot underline enough uh, just how meaningful it is when people in public life take that on. Um, and make it their responsibility. We work at the sharp end uh, of science communication and we have seen many situations in which researchers and science communicators are thrust into the public eye, uh, are forced to deal with issues that they perhaps didn't sign up for or indeed a pandemic um, that they may have predicted um, but we didn't expect this year. Um, and faced with that choice, of an easy life uh, or to insist on sound science as the foundation of our public debate. And I think we all owe a debt to those who pick the latter. And so I thank you humbly for, um, for what you've done uh, and for your words tonight. And I say to everybody attending, which I know includes many researchers uh, who feel that they're pushing boulders up hills uh, and struggling with those difficulties, might you always be inspired and encouraged to do the best public service. Thank you. Thank you all.